Hi everybody, my name is Ivan. I have a Christmassy uh, outfit today. I couldn't find any hat or any other equipment for Christmas, so I decided to put on my red tie uh, just to emul emulate the good mood and, and Christmas and joy and so on. So today we have our last uh, webinar in the series of uh, Friday forecasting talks for this year, for 2020, and we will have uh, Sarah Darin and Eric Subatis from Forecast Pro uh, presenting. And before they do that, I will... Uh, I cannot send that, okay. I will uh, have a very short summary of what we have done so far, a little bit about the center and so on. So this is the center. Some of you who attended our previous events have already seen that uh, in, in the previous on previous slides. Uh, we do different services. We have different expertise in machine learning, supply chain forecasting, marketing analytics. You can see photos of our members of the center. So if you're interested in any of those areas or any of the services, let us know. Uh, a little bit about the webinars. This is the sixth webinar. We've already had five of them. Here is the table with the previous presenters, the companies and the topics. You can see that uh, something like 50% of the talks were by uh, our members, Jim Boylan, Oliver and Robert, but we also had uh, people from industry. And we are very grateful for Mike, Gunter, uh, Mike Gilliland, Sarah and Eric for agreeing to present. And we have diff uh, a quite uh, collection of different topics. All of these are, have been recorded and they are available on YouTube channel. The link to the YouTube channel is not very nice and uh, a bit difficult to type. So just I just uh, recommend that if you want to follow it, just go to Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting, type this in the search and uh, it will show you our channel. We plan to have six more webinars in the year 2021, January to March. Uh, I will actually start the first one. Uh, very rough topic is forecasting with exponential smoothing, but probably it will change a little bit. Then we will have uh, talks by other people from our team and not from our team. Uh, some talks would be slightly more technical, for example, uh, John Noguera from Sigma Excel will uh, say something about a PC for autocorrelated data. Um, some would be uh, more um, oriented to practitioners. And at the moment, we are still waiting for the topics from uh, three presenters. In, in any way, there is a landing page which you can follow, uh, which contains all the information about the past and the future events. It also has the links to YouTube and so on. And we have created a meetup group, uh, CIMA Friday Forecasting Talks. You can have uh, you have a link to this group uh, from our landing page. Uh, the idea is we will be switching from Eventbrite to Meetup um, because it seems to be a slightly simpler instrument for promoting the events. And we will also continue promoting it on LinkedIn if you prefer LinkedIn. Uh, I also want to take a chance to sort of uh, advertise the course that we will be delivering next year. This will be an online course on demand forecasting with R, focused on demand planners, data scientists and business analysts. It will be in April, at the end of April, uh, three hours uh, each day. Uh, so it will be online course, three hours per day, giving you a chance to do homework if you want and so on. This uh, course is more focused on the first part on demand forecasting rather than the second part with R, but we will use R as a, as a language for examples. If you're interested, there is this uh, landing page which contains all the information about this course. Right, so this is roughly what we had, what we will have as the center and you can keep in touch with us using different channels. Uh, we are on Twitter, we are on LinkedIn. You can send us an email and here is the uh, huge and uh, difficult YouTube channel link that we have. Um, 
Today we have, as I've already mentioned, Sarah Darren and Eric Subatis from Forecast Pro. They will present on the topic of pragmatic insight and forecasting during the global pandemic. And uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, I will pass this to Sarah, so please unmute yourself and let's uh, let's start. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, it is a pleasure to uh, to be here. And I have to make sure that this is sharing, don't I? There we go. Um, thank you very much, Ivan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so as Ivan mentioned, we are from Forecast Pro. And any of you um, who are not familiar with us, um, Forecast Pro is an off-the-shelf demand forecasting um, software. You'll get a chance to uh, see it a little bit um, as we uh, go through the presentation. We have some examples to show in it. And as uh, Ivan said, today we're going to be talking about the pandemic. So pragmatic insight on forecasting during a global pandemic. So a uh, pretty relevant topic right now. So before the pandemic, most companies had a pretty standard forecasting process. Um, so and typically this would start with um, updating your data and models. A lot of those models were probably being done with automatic forecasting. In Forecast Pro, we have something called expert selection, which will automatically find the right type of um, really extrapolative model for your data. So extrapolative methods like um, ARIMA, exponential uh, smoothing, and that was working well for a lot of items. And the way that um, these extrapolative methods work is it basically is assuming that what happened in the past is a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen in your forecast um, horizon. And with the pandemic, that, that um, theory that the past is going to look like the future um, was no longer relevant at all for most companies. So the pandemic really disrupted this standard forecasting process for, uh, for really most people. And that was because it was no longer a valid assumption that what happened in the past was going to be a good indicator for what was going to be um, rolling out from basically March, February, March 2020 through the, uh, the rest of um, the year. That said, the way that the uh, pandemic impacted people, industries, was really pretty different depending on what industry you were. So some businesses benefited while others took a hit. So, for example, at least in the uh, US, grocery sales um, really went up um, considerably once restaurants stopped serving, while there, anything travel related certainly took a, a, a big hit. Some businesses have stables, stabilized, others have not. Um, so there are a lot of businesses where they had a big impact in the beginning of the pandemic, um, and since then, through the summer, things started um, looking like a new normal, basically. But a lot of other companies have certainly uh, seen more of a kind of roller coaster ride. Um, and what's going on there is the pandemic has created a lot of uh, supply chain issues. The times are really long. There are a lot of like huge backfill orders, um, and that has been uh, problematic for companies in terms of you know demand being very volatile and that of course is not going to help the uh, um, ease of forecasting either for some businesses fundamental long-term demand has not shifted so necessities like you know personal care um, actually we'll look at an example of uh, uh, pet food another uh, another necessity for other businesses demand has stabilized at a new normal. So there seems to be a shift that um, might, might perpetuate for quite a while. Um, home improvement sales might be falling into that. Um, you know, another like a longer term, uh, a lot of real estate trends are probably going to be longer term too, where, you know, a lot of people, at least in the US, are moving out of the city into the, uh, the, the suburbs, um, and that is another thing that probably is going to be stabilized at a new normal as opposed to returning to, uh, to pre-COVID levels. 
other businesses continue to see shifts in demand as the uh, pandemic plays out. So as there are shutdowns, you know, different regulations going in and out, depending on, uh, you know, the, the current state of COVID in a given area, a lot of those regulations impact things like travel and restaurants. So those shifts in demands um, continue, depending on where, where, where the, what the government is saying. And impacts have certainly varied across geographies. A lot of that has to do with um, how bad the pandemic is in various geographies. And it also, at least in the United States, has a big impact, um, you know, how how restrictive um, the, uh, you know, lockdowns and, and things like that are. Um, that can uh, um, drive a lot of differences across geographies. And then we, we kind of like touched on this already, but um, businesses are really plagued by stockouts, longer lead times, and that is really, um, keeping the demand from stabilizing at a, a new normal. All right, well, as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna be taking a look at some examples in Forecast Pro. Um, she mentioned we're an off the shelf forecasting package, just as a quick 10 second primer for those of you who may haven't, uh, haven't heard of us before. Um, we serve a variety of forecasting purposes, but uh, we really emphasize forecasting demand for businesses. So it includes things like automatic forecasting, customized product hierarchies, collaboration with colleagues, um, accuracy tracking, among other functionalities. Uh, but here, we're going to use Forecast Pro to visualize some data and kind of get a sense of the picture that Sarah was just painting for us. Uh, this data set is industry level sales for retail. Um, you can see we have a simple hierarchy here with two levels. Um, we're starting here at the top. So this is aggregate retail sales um, across many different business sectors. And then from there, we can start breaking things down into individual business types um, across more specific industries. Um, so let, just to get a sense of that picture, let's take a look at three concrete examples that illustrate some of Sarah's points. Um, if we start with a business that's taken a hit, we can take a peek at food services. So this would be uh, restaurants and bars. Um, it's no surprise, of course, that there was a big drop in sales at the onset of the shutdown. You can see it's punctuated here uh, in April as things really bottomed out. Um, and then in the next few months, you know, business has resumed a bit, but you can see nowhere really near the levels of pre-COVID. Um, in stark contrast, as Sarah indicated, if we take a look at say food and, food and beverage stores, like say grocery stores, we see sort of the opposite behavior. Um, big spike here in March as people rushed stores and stocked up in advance of the shutdown and then as folks have been you know cooking many more cooking and preparing many more meals from home you can see once again that the level has sort of shifted here in the data um, and so both good examples of you know a, a new normal potentially um, and so as we'll talk about to foreshadow a little bit you know there's questions of you know will this new normal continue and for how long uh, but as a third example and Sarah will come back to this one briefly later. If we head over to say building materials, here we don't see much of a convincing impact at all. Um, as Sarah will talk about, this can be a little misleading because um, the impact can uh, still be quite severe when you get down to say like individual manufacturers, um, but still three different scenarios, um, you know, all impacted by COVID, but in very different ways. Okay, and jump back to the slides again here. Okay, so what are we hearing from our customers about uh, the, the impact of the pandemic? Well, it really mirrors a lot of what we've already talked about um, so far, um, but a considerable number of our customers are seeing a, uh, a new normal. So sales that have um, either stabilized at pre-COVID levels or at um, some new normal, either higher or lower than a uh, pre-COVID. -pre For those customers, um, adjusting statistical forecast models. Um, it, it's uh, what they probably can do at this point, and we'll go through some of the methodologies for doing that, this is to account for the historic impact in that kind of March, April um, region. And once that's done, they can start relying on extrapolative methods a little bit more. Um, and the reason for that is that um, because it has stabilized, when you're using those extrapolative methods now, um, it's likely that the uh, um, 
the forecast is going to be pretty much at that kind of new normal level. And that means that the statistical baseline is going to be a pretty good starting point. There might have to be some overrides made, um, but nothing too, um, too extensive. We're, but we're also hearing a lot more from customers about this unstable demand issue. Um, this really is probably the uh, most common thing that we're, we're hearing from customers that the ups and downs are really difficult to, uh, to deal with. We're also hearing that big box and e-commerce are seeing large spikes. And this is um, very related to the, uh, um, the previous point as well. And it all has to do with really kind of the you know, supply chain um, issues. So what's happening here is that when you have these very large customers like um, Amazon, for example, once they stock out, um, they're placing very large orders because they're such big customers to resupply and make up for these stock outs to fill back orders that they may have, and then they stock out again. So big box e-commerce ends up being um, a, a big cause of this kind of like up and down roller coaster ride that a lot of our um, our customers, who typically are you know the smaller manufacturers, really um, are are typically seeing. Many customers are also resisting using statistical models at all right now. So either they are just using a baseline model that only uses data through, say, February 2020, um, and then using that as a, a starting point, um, or they're just relying on things um, that aren't really statistical, maybe looking at like, you know, same as last year or, um, or things like that as a, as a starting point. Now, that made sense at the beginning of the pandemic when there really was very limited data and doing that meant that you're really only um, holding out, you know, one or two, um, if you're using weekly data, maybe four or five um, periods of history towards the end of your data. But now that we're eight months into it, um, we really typically recommend to customers that instead of um, avoiding using that historical data, to figure out how to integrate it into their, their baseline forecasts. And then we're also finding that most users are focusing on forecasting primarily the remainder of 2020, which of course is coming to a close anyways. So maybe like the next couple months, but there is an understanding, I think that it is somewhat um, futile to um, know what's going to um, happen in six months, nine months. So um, most customers are resisting the urge for like say forecasting all of next year. And that certainly does make um, a lot of sense. So as we've been uh, working with customers um, as to how to uh, you know deal with the impact of the pandemic, we found it has been very useful to think of the pandemic in in different phases and depending on the phase, the different the types of techno um, methodologies that you might want to use for addressing it might be um, different. Now, in the beginning, what we heard from our customers was um, there had just been a huge impact on sales. Um, maybe the company or supplier had um, completely shut down. So, you know, sales were pretty much going to zero. Um, or maybe sales had exploded as people were stockpiling on things like paper towels and, um, and toilet paper. And at this point, our customers really had no idea how to, uh, how to deal with this. There was a lot of um, uncertainty around the data. The data also was what we would um, think of as an edge condition, um, so that these spikes or big dips are happening in your last data period. And that makes it particularly difficult to, to deal with because you really have no idea where it's going from there, where, whether it's a temporary shift, whether it's a permanent shift. Um, so really difficult to, to deal with that. And at that point, um, our recommendations, we did actually a, um, a webinar in April on this, and our, our main recommendation was to really exclude those last two edge condition um, uh, periods and use a baseline statistical forecast that excluded those and then apply a lot of judgmental overrides. At this point, most customers um, hopefully have uh, um, are no longer in that beginning stage and 
they are, and that's not, there we go, the middle. Um, a lot of customers are, are right in the middle of uh, this um, pande pandemic at this point. So at this point, um, there's more data to work with, but that data hasn't stabilized. And what we're seeing is, you know, those swings in sales, again, that roller coaster ride, that those all those supply chain issues are causing a lot of problems. Um, customers are placing really large orders to restock. And at this point, um, statistical baseline models can incorporate post COVID data, um, but it's not um, it's not that easy. You still need to account for for swing. So again, in terms of recommending how customers approach this, um, we definitely recommend that they use the full um, historic data through you know going into the fall and and the winter. But um, it's really critical that they account for a lot of these big swings in the data, understand when stockouts are are happening, um, account for all these big spikes and and dips, and it does mean that ultimately, um, once they come up with the, that baseline forecast, judgment is still going to be really important. Um, and judgment about, you know, say when um, those big stockouts, when those uh, um, huge orders might be coming in, um, becomes pretty relevant. And then finally, um, there are, again, are some people who are a little bit lucky and they have moved out of that middle um, roller coaster phase, or maybe they were never really in it. Um, but again, this goes back to those customers where um, recent data has stabilized and they're actually in pretty good shape to use the full data history and generate um, statistical baseline forecasts with that history. Um, they, we definitely recommend that they account for those spikes and dips in the uh, around March and April in those um, forecasts or in their history. Um, but once they do, again, what comes out of those, of, if they're using extrapolative methods, extrapolative methods are probably um, going to be pretty, pretty good. And they'll um, need a lot fewer overrides than say if they were in the middle of this pandemic journey, so to speak. So the tricky part, of course, is that no one's waving a flag and telling our customers exactly when they're shifting from what we've defined as the beginning, middle and end. Um, and so the strategy kind of revolves around, like Sarah said, integrating their data with this element of judgment in assessing where they stand. And so we're going to consider kind of two discrete scenarios um, illustrated with some real data. In the first, we can see this bottoming out of demand during the shutdown. This is followed by what you might call a recovery period as demand starts to rise again. And then that new normal that Sarah was referring to as demand starts to level off. And so, of course, the question is, you know, what is the new normal? When's it going to hit uh, and so on? Um, but we'll take a, a look at an example for this in a sec. As another example that we'll take a peek at, um, as Sarah mentioned, some businesses are seeing some pretty brutal volatility. And so here, once again, we see the sharp dip in demand um, potentially as a result of a stock out, followed by a recovery, um, and then this frantic filling of back orders. And so we see this big spike, which leads to another stock out recovery. And once again, another frantic filling of back orders. So once again, both very different scenarios um, and difficult to forecast for different reasons. Uh, for the remainder of the presentation, we're going to consider some practical strategies to deal with this kind of uncertainty. Um, I'm going to start off by talking a bit mostly about event models. Um, we'll talk a little bit about overrides, but really focusing on the former because that lets us leverage our data. The majority of our customers are really relying mostly on their historical data and their judgment, right? That's sort of all they got. Um, and many are forecasting at pretty significant scales, so thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of items. Um, and so the advantage of these former strategies um, is that you can use the data that you have and they're pretty scalable. Uh, but afterwards, Sarah is also going to talk about using dynamic regression models uh, to incorporate explanatory variables uh, into the forecasting as another strategy. Um, both, uh, both of these strategies are going to have a heavy element of scenario planning. So with that said, let's dive back into some real data. Bear with me while I share my screen once again. 
All right, so taking those two scenarios in turn, the first example we're going to look at is from one of our customers uh, in the apparel business. Um, we've simplified this data set down a great deal, so we're just considering a single shirt. Um, and you can see it's broken down by sizes and colors. And if I leaf through a couple of these, kind of mirroring some of the other examples we saw, you know, some of these don't appear to have any, you know, big impact from the pandemic, uh, but others like this one, which is the one we're going to consider, uh, you can see sort of that characteristic drop followed by this recovery and arguably the beginning of this new normal. So that's where we get into this question of, you know, is this the new normal um, and when's it going to hit? Um, to sort of wrap our minds around this, we're going to use some event driven models or event index models. Um, for those of you, just as an aside, for those familiar with exponential smoothing, these models are, are basically an extension of smoothing where we're defining unique indices in place, uh, if I should say event indices in place of the conventional seasonal ones for certain periods. Um, if you're not, not familiar with smoothing, don't worry about it. You don't need to to follow along with the example. And of course, as Ivan said, um, they'll be running a webinar on it on January 15th, so you might want to check that out. Uh, but let's consider some scenarios. You can see I've built three here, and I'm going to start by applying the first one. And here you can see what we've done is we've really sort of evented out uh, April through July, sort of assuming that those are sort of the abnormal periods, but now we've hit our new normal. And so you can see we've sort of resumed our pre-COVID patterns but at this new reduced level of activity. As a second scenario, here we anticipate that this new normal quote unquote is really just going to last through the end of 2020. Um, and then we're going to resume demand at pre COVID levels. And so we did this once again by using these unique event indices, not just through the recent historical demand, but also applying it to a handful of um, near forecast periods. Uh, and finally, if we take a look at our last scenario here, we're under the assumption that, you know, really we're going to resume pre COVID levels right away. Probably wishful thinking, um, but another scenario to consider. And so the key here, once again, is, you know, we're wrapping our minds around this uncertainty by considering a few discrete scenarios. We're still going to need our judgment going forward because we're going to have to pick one um, as far as what plan to actually execute. Um, but this enables us still to leverage the data that we have um, and use a model driven approach to come up with the forecast. Now, as a second example, this will follow along more with the second scenario we looked at. So, uh, you know, still an element of new normal, um, but in the meantime, we're dealing with this really nasty volatility. Um, and so this example is sales of consumer electronics through e-commerce. Uh, once again, this is data from one of our customers selling through Amazon. Uh, you can see we have a handful of electronics queues here. And if we just look at, say, one or two, you can see kind of this one's more characteristic of that second scenario with this big gap, this big spike, this big gap. If we go down here, same kind of deal. Um, but once again, we're sort of in the middle of it because, of course, we don't have the advantage of the pretty graph <laughs> that we saw on the slides, and we're deciding how we want to approach this going forward. And so once again, we've built a couple event schedules that represent these event driven models. Um, and the assumption here for the most part is going to be pretty similar. Um, I should note that a lot of our customers are really in this plan for 2020 mode, you know, trying to get through the end of the year. And so these are going to be pretty representative of that. So for example, if I apply my event schedule here, here we're sort of assuming that we're going to continue this very volatile pattern in the near term and then sort of level out to a new normal next year. Or if I jump to this 502L and apply it, same kind of deal, though you can see that the, the model ends up picking a pretty naive forecast following that, because the reality is we just really don't know what's going to happen in 2021. So for now, we're just planning on kind of dealing with these volatile swings in demand. Uh, once again, the common thread here is the expectation of um, similar patterns in the near future leveraging our data as best we can and combining it with our judgment. Um, of course, there are more direct ways of building our judgment into the forecast as well. Um, you could do things, you know, Sarah alluded to this during some of the examples, particularly uh, in the very beginning, beginning of the pandemic, where we can apply simply just direct overrides on top of the forecast. That can still be very valuable. Many of our customers um, have very collaborative processes, gathering input from their account reps or salespeople or other folks on their commercial teams. 
um, in order to adjust forecast directly. Um, but either way, the goal is to really combine our data and our judgments to get a better forecast. And just to reiterate, the advantage of these techniques is we don't really need anything besides our history and they're very scalable. So I could very quickly use these same models and techniques across dozens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of items. And so with that said, I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, um, who will talk about another strategy using dynamic regression modeling to handle uh, this fluctuating demand. Okay. So dynamic regression is certainly a lot more complicated than um, event models um, and some of the other just purely extrapolative techniques, but it is um, also a really powerful tool for quantitatively understanding how the pandemic may have impacted your sales historically and how it might impact your demand in the future. So. We're not going to get too um, in depth about exactly how uh, what dynamic regression is and how it works, um, but the general idea is that dynamic regression allows for the introduction of explanatory variables. So an explanatory variable essentially is a sales driver. So changes in the explanatory variable are associated with uh, changes in demand. So one of our classic classic examples. Um, is temperature and electricity. When you see temperature um, go up, you typically, or at least when it's in the summer, you typically are going to see um, electric electricity usage surge as well as people are turning on uh, their, their air conditioning. So when you're modeling something like electricity, dynamic regression is um, very often going to be a very good technique um, for incorporating that temperature effect, and it is not something that you could be doing through an um, event model. So allowing for the introduction of explanatory variables allows you also to account for things like stockouts, demand surges, um, and early spikes or dips. And that can be relatively straightforward. And honestly, it's um, the, the way that works is pretty similar to um, event models because essentially what you're doing there is you're using indicator variables, um, dummy variables to um, show when when these off and on type like events are, are occurring. But dynamic regression also allows you to integrate continuous explanatory variables. Um, so continuous um, data can take on a different range of values. It's not just um, on or off like um, like events or indicator variables. Um, a good example of that would be price. So price is very often going to be a very relevant explanatory variable in a demand forecasting model. In the pandemic, there are a bunch of other continuous types of variables that are going to be really relevant in a um, a regression model as well. So things like COVID-19 cases and deaths um, and that type of data is uh, is available um, online. In um, the US we refer to the uh, IHIM data that comes out of the uh, University of, um, of Washington and it's a really great data source for um, it gets very detailed in terms of, you know, I, I think it's available daily for pretty much every country out there, and it actually provides forecasts for um, a bunch of different metrics as well. So cases, deaths and um, hospitalizations, and that can be really useful if you want to be um, integrating the impact of a uh, of COVID on your demand forecasts. You also have um, mobility metrics widely available, so um, this is referred to as the Google mobility data and essentially what the Google mobility data does is I believe that they have six different indices that track how post pandemic people's movement um, has changed versus pre pandemic. Um, so for example, we're going to take a look at a grocery store um, mobility metric where what it's looking at is how much people are going to the grocery store each um, well, you can get it each day, but what we'll be looking at is each month relative to what it was um, pre pre pandemic. Um, and the pandemic has certainly had a really big impact on um, the, the economy. Well, although I would argue that 
the um, impact on the economy or the, the changes in employment um, might might be quite different from uh, the impact of employment in um, previous uh, economic downturns. Um, but that said, it, it, it might be very important to also include a lot of these um, key economic variables like um, like unemployment in a uh, dynamic dynamic regression model. But um, as we keep talking about, um, regression is really hard. What, why is it hard? Well, in terms of understanding how to specify a, a regression well, that definitely takes some expertise. Um, ideally, you actually will be taking a course in dynamic regression so you can understand what um, what the assumptions are about um, you know, normality and independence and uh, independent variables and, and things like that. Um, and it also makes your, um, your forecast process um, more onerous because there's more data to collect and, and manage. So even once you set up a dynamic regression, um, the ongoing maintenance of that model is going to be um, a lot more difficult than if you were using something like um, an event model, um, more of a single variable type of uh, approaches. But another, another problem with dynamic regression is that in order to generate demand forecasts, you need to have forecasts for your explanatory variables. Um, and because of this, dynamic regression also is going to work very well with um, scenario planning in general. So um, dynamic regression allows for a scenario planning. Um, and the idea of scenario planning is you use different possible forecasts for your explanatory variables to generate a range of different what if forecasts. Um, so scenario planning is certainly based on judgment, but when you're in, in the face of um, so much uncertainty, it is always going to take that uh, judgment. And dynamic regression also allows you to incorporate that judgment in a particularly rigorous, more disciplined way than perhaps just making judgmental overrides in, in an override grid. And the assumptions are more easily um, documented. And we talked a little bit about you know, the IHEIM data and the Google Mobility data. Um, and the advantage of using that is um, a lot of that data comes up, comes with kind of built in scenarios that you can uh, can you can use. So the uh, data scientists that are that maintain this data are actually forecasting the data as well. So we can understand where you know each region is we expect them where we expect them to go. And um, IHEIM in particular provides a best case and worst case um, scenario in addition to the kind of like the expected scenario. And um, when they do those forecasts, there are a bunch of different assumptions that they um, that they make. They can provide those um, assumptions for their best case versus worst case. It, um, it is mostly um, tied to um, mask usage um, at this point. But that does mean that you can use a best case scenario in um, in a forecast model and then your demand forecast can be the best case pandemic um, forecast scenario. So let's actually take a look at how how you can do this in Forecast Pro. So I'm going to switch over. So as promised, we're going to be looking at and actually I'm going to go to the historic view first here. Um, what we're looking at here is um, is pet food. So this is what we would consider to be a, um, a necessity, certainly. So you know, pets pets need to eat, and they need to eat about the same amount each month. So we don't expect it to be seasonal. You can see in the beginning here, there's um, it's trending upwards. I so we don't see it on the screen. Yeah. You don't. Interesting. I still see slides. Yeah. Yeah, oh here. yes, I see. I, I was looking. There we go. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. So what we have here is um, again pet food data. So as I was saying, non-seasonal and it's trending up. Um, and once um, February and or actually March and April are hitting, you see that stockpiling uh, occurring in in the data. 
and then that's followed by this kind of like um, dropping not completely stable but it, it's about at that same kind of new normal level right now with some a little bit of you know spikes probably happening here from a little bit of a um, supply chain type of issues and you can also see over here i have read in grocery mobility from the uh, the google metrics um, pet food is not of course sold only in grocery stores but amongst the uh, the variables that are available um, for the Google mobility, the grocery mobility certainly seems to be the best indicator of you know, shopping behaviors for uh, for things like um, uh, buying pet food. So I'm actually going to now go to the forecast view. I'm not going to for that. I'm going to take off that regression model and I'm going to. We're going to take a look at what automatic forecasting does here. So First of all, if you look down here, you can see that the automatic forecast is an exponential smoothing model, um, an NACL model. Um, so it actually is saying that this is a seasonal, um, the, a seasonal um, data, and you can see that in the forecast. The forecast very much looks like what happened in the uh, the last year, and that's certainly um, not what we really expect to happen um, over over the next year. So this is not a, a good forecast. And you can also see we're showing the fitted values here. Um, the fitted values are not really tracking the uh, the history very well. So that's another good indicator that um, that this is not a great forecast. If we go down here and just quickly take a look at the MAPE and the MAD, um, we have a maybe of a little bit under 17%, not terrible, but we can probably do a lot better than that if we um, if we count for some of the uh, these dips and um, spikes in the uh, the data. So I am going to open up the uh, regression manager here, and um, so this is how we do regression in Forecast Pro. And the first thing I'm going to do is I want to account for this kind of stockpiling behavior that we see in March and April. Uh, for simplification, I'm only going to focus on the, the big spike in April right now. But basically, I could spike that out here by creating a spike variable in April. I'm going to go ahead and apply that. And you can already see that um, we're doing a lot better here. We don't see that seasonal pattern over um, in, in the forecast period either. But there is still, if you look at the, this period here, the actuals are still um, a little bit lower than these uh, fitted values. And that, um, my theory is going to be right now that that is because people start um, had stockpiled and then they were going to the grocery store a lot less. So I want to look at the impact of grocery mobility as well. So I'm going to add that to my model. I'm going to click OK. And again, you can see that shift. We see that the, the pattern is followed a little bit better here. And we see a forecast that shows uh, certainly a lot more of a recovery as grocery, mobility, grocery shopping habits uh, return to normal in, um, uh, for the scenario, the, the expected scenario that we're showing. And if we look at the model here, um, again, we don't want to get too much into the details of uh, interpreting um, regression models, but um, the general idea here, you can see in red, it says marked regressors are insignificant. So the black ones are significant. If um, you're comfortable with t-statistics, you can be looking at these t-stats here, see that they're all, um, this is the smallest one, 2.21 for the black. So both this spike is very significant and grocery mobility is a significant driver of, um, of pet food demand here. One of the other things that you want to be doing when you're um, doing a regression model is you want to ask yourself, does this model make sense? Um, certainly the stockpiling coefficient being positive makes a lot of sense. What about the grocery mobility one? It's 4,452. How do I interpret that? Um, Grocery mobility data is actually looking at the percentage change um, in grocery, um, in how much people are going to the grocery store relative to pre-pandemic. So it's really about percents. 
Um, so what this means is that if gross mobility increases by 1% um, relative to the uh, pre-pandemic, that's going to drive um, 4,452 incremental units of, uh, of pet food sales. So there's a positive impact and that certainly makes sense and supports our theory going into this. So what about scenario planning? Um, I actually have another project that I already set up that lets us look at a few scenarios. And let me, I did not mean to go back to the slides there. And make sure this goes up here. Okay, so what we're looking at here, I'm going to go to the forecast view again. You can see that um, this is the same model that we had of the other ones. We have this 4,452 um, coefficient in here. But what I've read, done is I've read in um, two other SKUs. And if I go to the historic data view, actually, and if I look at these other ones, you can see they're identical. So same thing. And I also, in addition to the grocery store mobility, which I did not show in the other project, but again, this is all about percents. And you can see in April, there was a huge actually dip in grocery mobility as the lockdown hit down, came out, and then there was a, um, a return to a much lower, um, but going back up to, uh, to normal in the um, forecast period for, a, which is, I guess, pretty much starting right around year. Um, so we've read in that and you can see we've read in a few other scenarios as well. And actually it's pretty useful to look at these scenarios on a multi-item graph here. So I'm going to go multi-item graph and I'm going to select these three. So what you can see here is that through the historic um, data period, which goes through October, um, all the same, but then we have the good mobility scenario in green here showing a um, eventually a return to the uh, immediately before the pandemic levels. We have the red kind of expected um, scenario, and then we have a things aren't going to be so great scenario and it looks like this might be our uh, scenario um, for for the rest of the year actually once i read in these different scenarios i can use these different variables um, on these SKUs to create different forecasts so i'm actually going to go back to my forecast view so for example if we go to this best scenario I open up the dynamic regression here. I actually already built this uh, best one, but what you can see is it's the same as the kind of grocery middle, um, but instead of using this normal, the, the middle grocery mobility variable, I'm using the good one. And when we apply that, you can see we have the same model from the historic data, this 4,452, but because we're using a different um, scenario, um, for, during the forecast period for Google Mobility, we now have a different demand forecast um, scenario. And we can do that for the worst scenario as well. And we can see that that kind of follows that pattern too. And then finally, we can look at all of these um, to, together forecast scenarios. Um, and so now instead of Google Mobility, we're actually looking at our, our demand forecast and you can see that um, we have three different possibilities. These are forecast scenarios that you could take to um, management or whoever um, present what what you're assuming about your uh, your sales driver, your explanatory variables. And at that point, um, people can make some judgments about what they really expect to happen. And as I um, kind of mentioned earlier, at this point, as we look at some of the, uh, at least in the United States, what's happening with um, cases right now, um, it probably would make a lot of sense to assume that this worst case scenario is um, it's probably a pretty reasonable one until hopefully when the vaccine gets more widely uh, available, hopefully we go back to this kind of uh, this green um, best case scenario. So that is um, dynamic regression in Forecast Pro.
and I'm actually going to get back to my slides now and we're going to wrap this up. All right, so yeah, so just to briefly summarize, um, as Sarah mentioned at the beginning, COVID's impacted just about all businesses to some degree, um, but the magnitude and direction and the timing of that varies quite a bit across different products, different industries, and certainly uh, quite differently across our customer base. And now that we have um, eight, eight plus months of uh, post-pandemic onset data, demand forecasting is um, at least easier than it was in the beginning when there was so much um, uncertainty. Now, some businesses were primarily impacted in the spring and are starting to adjust for that impact and basically going back to using those extrapolative methods that we've described. Um, but others are still being challenged by that really volatile, unstable demand, you know, arguably more represented by that second example that we saw. And finally, dynamic regression can help quantify how the pandemic has impacted your business, um, generate longer run forecasts for different scenarios than if you're just kind of using those uh, shorter term extrapolative methods. But it's a lot of work. Um, building the models is a lot of work maintaining the models, feeding the models their data, a lot of work. So it definitely will complicate your uh, your forecasting process. Yeah, so first, thanks for, for listening and we look forward to some questions, uh, but uh, just real quickly, uh, as we talked about, we went through Forecast Pro a bit today with some examples. If you didn't want to learn more, we offer free live demos and we also offer free trials if you want to give it a go yourself. Um, so feel free to reach out, visit our website and check out some resources. Thank you. Okay. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, it, it was a bit longer than I expected and we have so many questions. <laughs> oh, but, uh, <laughs> that's OK. Uh, so I will first ask those that uh, have many thumbs up any of them. First is very brief and uh, obvious. Will the presenter slides be available after the talk? So I haven't asked you about that. Yep. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I believe they, they definitely are available um, and um, I, I believe I sent those to you this morning. Yes, yes. So I will uh, circulate them. Uh, please stay tuned. We will share the slides. Uh, the more uh, meaty question, I would say, to use the dynamic regression, you have to have a prediction of explanatory variables, right? Uh, how do you achieve that with the Google uh, data? So the Google data does not provide the, uh, the those different forecasts. So what I did for that particular example is the IHON data actually does have mobility forecasts available um, available in it. And again, when if so, actually, let me um, let me show the uh, the data set there where. So the Google Mobility data is here. The IHIM data, I believe, is right here in some different scenarios. But if you go here, when you actually download the data, um, it will um, download best, best mask scenarios is what they call it, and worst mask scenarios. And included in that is all metrics, including the mobility metrics. So what I had done was I looked at those different scenarios for mobility in general, looked at kind of the changes and applied those to the uh, the Google mobility data. OK, uh, thanks for the clarification. The next question, how would one uh, do this approach if one has very many SKUs and product categories? Manually, this might be a, a tedious uh, task taking a lot of uh, hours. Well, you you can apply um, these regression models across many items at one time. So Forecast Pro supports what we call item specific explanatory variables. Um, so for example, if you um, had a lot of SKUs, you had the price for all those SKUs, you can read in the, the price for all those SKUs across all of your SKUs and just call it price. So you would be able to build a model of, you know, say a price promotion model where you have 
promotion variables and price variables across all your SKUs. You can build it just calling those variables price and promo. And if you apply that model um, in mass across all of the SKUs, um, it will work kind of like what Eric showed us. Um, and it will use the item specific price, the item specific promotions um, for for each of the uh, the models that builds so that there is some um, some ability to kind of apply those models in a in a mass type of way um, that said if you do that it does kind of limit your ability to review a lot of the statistics about that a given model um, for an individual skew um, yeah just to jump in there i think that question may have actually come in in response to the event index models that we are presenting just timeline wise. So everything Sarah said is true, <laughs> of course, of regression, but also frankly of the, the event models. Um, you get a little specific with Forecast Pro here a bit, but but even that aside, you know, those those event models, what you're really crafting are these schedules of where these indices fall. And those are just really just discrete units. And you can take that event model and apply it across a lot of data. So not necessarily has to be limited to Forecast Pro, but certainly a tool like Forecast Pro makes it really easy to take like a just a given event schedule and you know more or less the same as what Sarah described for regression, take that same model and apply it to large chunks of your data. Um, and so actually something like COVID works pretty well for that technique because presumably these event indices or whatever we want to call them, are, you know, they're really gonna probably fall on pretty similar periods for, for large chunks of our business. Like in contrast to say like COVID aside, and if we have very different promotional schedules for many of our SKUs, that can be a lot tougher to manage because that really does get specific by category and by item. Um, whereas something like COVID, you know, that a lot of our data might fall into the same bucket. Um, the other thing just worth noting, this might be obvious to some, not to others, you know, the impact of that event schedule on a given item, is, even if we apply it to many of them, it is going to be specific to the behavior of that particular item. So that's worth noting from a clicks perspective, it's two clicks, but you can get some pretty different forecasts depending on individual SKU and product category behavior. Okay, thank you both. Uh, next question is related to this one, I think. It is, uh, how do you come with these uh, scenarios? Uh, it seems to be important uh, due, to, due to the fact that the predictions will completely drive the forecasts, so you need to have adequate scenarios. Yeah, I mean, for that, again, the scenarios are based on, on judgments. Um, so in terms of that, I think that that is more making sure that you communicate with um, other people in your organization about what they what they do expect um, and um, being kind of, you know, coming up to some type of agreement about what are the different scenarios that do make sense for, for your business. Um, and again, you know, one of the things that I find appealing about um, you know this is that in regards to the pandemic itself these uh, there are you already have somebody going and building some different scenarios for you when it comes to things like you know your the supply chain issues that is going to be more problematic but it's also something that um, your organization and you might have more insight um, into because it's really being driven by, um, you know, the, the the customers that you're dealing with and might have, you know, more kind of um, information about what might be going on and what you, you know, the, the types of volatilities that you expect moving forward. But yes, that, that is a, um, a big problem certainly um, and is it a problem across all of these different techniques it's a problem about you know forecasting during a pandemic in general that there's just so much uncertainty um, and the scenarios do, don't take away the uncertainty but it does put some type of rigor um, around trying to organize that that uncertainty yeah i'd also draw attention back to a comment sarah made toward the end it was, it was kind of a brief one but to paraphrase it was basically like you know, here are three scenarios and we might take these to management and document them. And so I, I think that I'm somewhat underscoring what, what she just described, but um, kind of documenting them and really being clear about what the assumptions behind the models are. Um, certainly with something like regression, um, you know, your assumptions are behind the forecast are arguably riskier <laughs> than others because, uh, you know, that garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. Um, but if you, you know, if you would document them, then at least you can justify your use of them. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the 
both answers. We're actually running out of time, but I will still uh, ask several more questions if you don't mind. Do you have anywhere to go? Um, so there are two questions which are related. Uh, one is how shall we produce prediction intervals in the pandemic? pandemic? And uh, another one, uh, John Boylan asked, uh, how have you dealt with safety stock estimation given greater forecast error uncertainty in the post-COVID era? I think both uh, have some similarities. Yeah, so okay, first of all, on the prediction interval one, um, that 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 is a problem you know we certainly we have confidence intervals built into a forecast pro but um what they don't account for is um basically they all of those intervals are going to be um, assuming that the um, forecast for the explanatory variables are deterministic so to speak they're not uh, there's not going to be um confidence intervals around those explanatory variables and they're really um, should be to have really accurate prediction intervals. Um, so coming out of Forecast Pro, quite honestly, the prediction intervals um, would be um, underestimating the true level of uncertainty because it's not incorporating the, the explanatory variable ones. Um, so, you know, to do that, that probably is the type of thing that you would need to go outside of um, Forecast Pro and do probably some, you know, kind of Monte Carlo simulation type of thing to, um, you know, um, to reproduce some of the uh, that that uncertainty both in the in the explanatory variables and then to understand how it impacts the uh, prediction intervals for for demand. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the other question? There was enough safety stock. Safety stock, yeah. Ah, safety stock. Um, so you know kind of the uh, the same thing for for safety stock um again in terms of going outside of um forecast pro if you want to be using safety stock within the product um you probably can be making some type of adjustments about the level to which perhaps the uh, composite intervals might be um underestimated um mm -hmm. so but but there would have to be some um, customization that it, it's it's a it's a good valid point that that uncertainty um, in the explanatory variables really should be incorporated both into your confidence intervals and into your uh, safety stock estimates. Yes. Well, I, I should probably make a note here that uh, this is a very difficult question, <laughs> even <laughs> from academic point of view. So I don't think that we have any uh, good answers to that. And so people are just asking whether you have a golden bullet for this or something like that. And so obviously very difficult. Uh, there is another question which is more technical, I would say. Uh, saying that when the, there is pandemic, uh, it seems that data becomes non-stationary. Well, at least the behavior changes rapidly, right? Uh, what about dynamic regression? Would it work on such non-stationary data? And uh, uh, what, what about alternatives like state-based models? Are they better fit for such situations? What uh, do you think from your um. So we, we do not explicitly have state space models in here, although at one point in time we certainly do did. In terms of the stationarity, um, regression does not. Um, you know, our REMA models certainly will do differencing for stationarity purposes as well. Um, but again, within the regression um, scenario, if you do actually um, feel that you know, stationarity has become an issue, you have the ability to do differencing um, and use that as a alternative quote unquote skew for actually developing the model. Um, so it's not going to be quite as flexible as, you know, um, doing differencing and say R or something like that, but you certainly have the um, ability to account for the stationarity and um, non-stationarity uh, potentially in your uh, dependent variable and then um, read it in and use a, a dynamic regression model. Okay. Uh, good. 
if you don't, if Eric doesn't have anything to add to that, let's uh, ask a question about bullwhip effect. Are you aware whether demand swings have provoked uh, high bullwhip effects of what's in the supply chain? Have you seen anything like that? Um, actually, could you uh, repeat that? Like it was getting quiet for me. Yes, so are you aware whether demand swings have provoked a bullwhip effect uh, upwards in the supply chain? Um, I I am not necessarily. Um, so, um, and, and actually I'm looking towards Eric because he actually <laughs> might know more about the supply chain stuff than I do. Um, I'm more of the uh, um, statistician. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to pass on that question, I suppose, mostly because I mean, mo I tend to deal mostly with, I guess, intra-customer forecasting, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, but, you know, okay. that, for some of these questions, we can kick them around internally, too, and maybe get back to the, the poser yeah. of the question. Yeah, no, actually, and I was going to ask if there are, say that if there are questions that we don't get to, um, we would be happy to have those e um, questions emailed to us. Um, so I'm S. Darren at forecastpro.com. Eric is E. Suvatis at forecastpro.com. So um, we would be happy to uh, address any other questions um, via email as well. Typically, when we do our um, our internal um, webinars, we um, will have people. We we will um, get back to anybody um, that we don't have a chance to answer during the actual webinar via email. OK, I think this is a good way to wrap things up, to be honest, because we still have several questions. Uh, I will uh, forward those questions to you okay. and maybe we can publish them uh, in social media and uh, our pages and so on. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. Uh, as uh, Sarah said, I also wanted to mention that uh, you have uh, your own webinars and maybe we can share the link or something like that. Uh, yeah. So in the follow up materials, we will send some additional uh, things. Okay. Um, but I guess that's it for today. Thank you very much for an interesting presentation and thanks everyone for asking the questions. And thank you for having us. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. That was Robert. He's, uh, I guess, sending his regards. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Have a nice day and uh, see you next year in 2021 for the next uh, series of events. Bye-bye.